It was in December 2013 that Rowan Williams came to Nijmegen for the first time. Or at least his first time to Radboud University. And he was there because of the Edward Schillebeek's lacing that he was going to hold. And because this is a bit of a prestigious project, we had arranged some extras that we usually don't have at our lectures. Like music, music drinks and the service to pick up uh, the speaker from the airport. And I was going to do that because I was the program manager. And the day before this all was going to take place, I spoke, of, I spoke to one of the guys from the band that was going to perform the next day, and I was telling him where he should be standing and how everything was going to proceed. And at a certain point, he asked me, but this Roman Williams, who is he actually? And I answered and I said, well, he's a very t famous theologian, and he also used to be the Archbishop of uh, the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And um, my friend replied by saying, all right, so you're going to pick up the Pope from the airport. <laughs> and I was laughing and I said, yeah, well, you could put it that way. And when I had finished laughing, I started thinking. And I started thinking mainly about the car that I was supposed to pick him up in. <laughs> because I drive a very old and battered Renault Twingo with children's seats in the back. And I started wondering, was this the kind of car that I could pick up the Pope in from the airport? <laughs> but it was already late and I decided not to put any more stress on myself and just go ahead the way I planned it and see what would happen. So the following morning I drove to Schiphol Airport I arrived 30 minutes late because the navigation device in my car was as old as the car itself. But fortunately, Professor Williams' plane also had a delay. So we arrived at the same time. We met. He got into the car. He didn't complain. Um, I drove him to Nijmegen safely and we had a very nice chat on the way going there. So from that moment on, I knew that Professor Williams is not only a brilliant theologian, and a very wise churchman, but that he's also a very kind and modest man. So you will understand that I am very, very pleased, very delighted that he is here again tonight, that he was able to accept the invitation of the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology and Religion Studies in cooperation with the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences and Radboud Reflects. And he will speak to you in a minute about the failure of mass democracy. And I'm sure that from the moment he enters the floor, everything will speak for itself. So I'm going to shortly introduce to you the moderators of tonight, Joshua Fanol and Ellen van Wolder, both theologians from our Radboud University. And they are going to interview him from their own expertise and from everything that happens during the evening. Um, my name is Lisbeth Janssen. I am a program manager at Radboud Reflect. I wish you all a wonderful evening, but... Before I give the floor to Professor Williams, I'm going to read you a poem. And not just any poem, but maybe not all of you know that Roman Williams is a very meritorious poet as well. So I thought I'd pick three poems from his work and recite them to you in the course of the evening. And I will start with, please close this door quietly. The slow, loud door, pushing against a mount of dust, dust floating heavily in a still room. Step slowly, stones can deceive. The ground looks firm, but the dust makes you blink and feel for purchase. This is marshlands. Difficult lie to sting eyes, terrain whose spring and tangle hides deep gaps called pools, old workings, careful. Too much left here of unseen lumber dropped, knowingly or not, behind the door to trip you while you rub awkwardly at naked eyes, open on thick, still, damp, scented air, imprinted, used and recycled, not clearing up, catching, catching, 
the weather of memory. Underfoot lost tracks wind round an ankle, and abandoned diggings, wells, mines, foundations wait for your foot to find them, drop you into the unexpected chill, the snatched breath and swift seeing. The birds flap at the edge of your eyes' world, things left but alive, a space shared, a stone yielding. Professor Williams, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for the privilege of inviting me to the university once again. Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed for your very generous introduction. Um, I will lay down my papal crown once again <laughs> to try and engage humanly. But thank you also for your very moving reading of the little piece that you chose. We're used to using the word democracy as a term that is self-evidently a good thing. But for quite a lot of Western history, the word has been rather disreputable. Plato certainly didn't think much of the idea of democracy, and many followed him in taking it for granted that democracy simply meant the rule of the mob, the mass. As late as the syllabus errorum in the 19th century, the papacy had similar views about democracy. It was seen as power exercised by the crowd. So how is it that a word with such a disreputable background has come to represent for many of us in the world today the ultimate ideal for social justice and equity. I'd want to argue that the modern respectability of the word has quite a lot to do with what democracy is not. It's not autocracy. It's not oligarchy. It's not dictatorship, and so on. In other words, it's not a system in which one person or a small group of persons exercises unaccountable authority over others. It's presented in these terms as what happens when illicit or illegitimate forms of political power disappear. The narrative that we like to tell is the narrative of the Enlightenment. Once upon a time, political authority was top-down, irresponsible, arbitrary, and frequently religious, worse still. But when rationality began to dawn on the European mind, somewhere around 1730, then something else happened. Then people understood that true legitimacy comes from popular support. Take away autocracy, dictatorship, and so forth, and what happens is democracy. Now, in the last couple of decades, we've seen how that doctrine has demonstrated its long life and resilience. Western powers have advanced where angels fear to tread in the Middle East on the assumption that when you take away tyranny, democracy happens. Simply to mention Iraq or Libya ought to remind us that the cultural history we're talking about is perhaps just a little bit more complicated than that. But the assumption persists that political legitimacy, a lawful, defensible political system, requires popular legitimation. It requires a popular 
mandate. Legitimate political authority is not a transcendent given coming from above, nor is it the pragmatic rule of the wealthy and the already powerful. Democracy exists as a legitimate form of government, an ideally legitimate form of government, because it is the result of a critique of transcendent, non-accountable, top-down power. And so it appears to mesh very well and very closely with a broadly secular or secularizing trend. If you take away transcendent legitimation from political power, what you're left with, surely, is the argument of rational citizens, without appeal to principles or dictates that are not drawn from public popular discernment. And so, in spite of the somewhat checkered adventures of democracy in places like Iraq and Libya, we continue to suppose that the essence of legitimate political order is popular mandate, that popular mandate equals democracy, and that this is an appropriate vehicle for a secularized culture. <coughs> In these brief remarks this evening, I want to unpick that set of arguments and suggest where some of the weaknesses might be found and where we might have to think again about how we're defining the word democracy. And I believe that this is increasingly an urgent matter. You won't need me to remind you and certainly in the light of the results of the German election, you won't need me to remind you, especially today, that the rise of populism across Europe and on the other side of the Atlantic has posed a stark question to the idea of democracy itself, partly because of the implicit and explicit claim that populism is itself a legitimate democratic solution. So we have appeals to the popular will, the popular mind. Those in Britain who disputed the legality of proceeding to Brexit without a parliamentary, parliamentary vote were dubbed by the popular press enemies of the people. And in President Trump's America, in Theresa May's Britain, and elsewhere across the world, that language of the people's will, identified with a populist majority, has come to be, I believe, dangerously confused with the democratic ideal. So let me try and look at the terms we use and the problems that are raised for our own present context by some of these difficulties. To go back to Plato again, Plato's argument in The Republic about the foundations of politics begins with the question of why it is that justice is not to be identified with what the powerful decide. Those of you who've read Plato's Republic will recall the long discussion in the first couple of books about whether justice is simply the interest of the stronger. And a Plato-shaped objection to modern mass populist democracy would be the danger of turning democracy into the tyranny of a majority vote. If all we believed about democracy was that it represented 
a majority mandate with which there was no discussion, we would, I think, reasonably feel rather uncomfortable about recommending this because, as a culture, we have rightly become immeasurably more sensitive to the moral rights and claims of minorities. We have become aware that the will of a majority cannot itself be regarded as determining the status of minority groups. And for all our flailing around on the subject of what democracy means today, there would be very few people who would openly defend a version of democracy which sidestepped the issue of the rights of minorities. Indeed, there's a reputable tradition in political philosophy and even in political theology of regarding the treatment of minorities as a sign of whether a democracy is indeed legitimate, lawful or not. So in the late 19th century, the great English Catholic historian and historiographer, John Acton, Lord Acton, professor at Cambridge, argued precisely that the distinctive moral understanding of democracy built in attention to the needs of minorities and the liberty of minorities. He also argued that the understanding of religious liberty in a society and what that meant was the beginning of an understanding of all forms of genuine political liberty. But that's perhaps another question. The point is that we seem, for all our confusion over democracy, still to hold to a picture of it which is less populist than some might imagine, more interested in the rights of minorities. But to understand why that is, we need to step back a little further again to a very fundamental set of moral and political principles. If a majority in a state has the right to determine law, as all democracies assume, what that means is not that the majority has a right to end discussion and discernment in society. A majority may come to a view of the social good supported by the greater number of the population. And that gives a prima facie plausibility to the idea that what they decide is lawful, a defensible policy with a degree of legitimacy. What it can't do is to say that discussion is now at an end. The risk of mass democracy, majoritarianism, or populism, call it what you will, is the assumption that a majority has the right to end discussion. That what is decided by a majority view is not merely lawful, but right, and therefore indisputable. This is a notion which I think we may rightly query. If justice is not the rule of the stronger, then majorities don't determine what is right. What they determine may have a claim on the respect, even the obedience, of the population if enacted into law. But that doesn't end the argument. In other words, I would say legitimate democracy assumes the need for opposition. And a democracy begins to fail when it fails to have an active and articulate opposition. <laughs>
And by opposition, I don't mean simply an opposing party in the legislature. I mean a civil society in which individuals and communities are able to raise difficult, difficult questions for government. In which such bodies and such individuals are able to say, we accept that this is lawful. We don't necessarily accept that it is right or true. And we reserve the right to argue about this. And if such individuals and communities are allowed the right to argue, the right of the minority to speak from its identity and its conviction needs to be secured in a proper working democracy so that the rule of law, which grants access to the same processes to every citizen, becomes part of how we understand the democratic ideal. So a democracy that has some claim to be moral is one which builds into its processes not simply mass opinion, majority voting, but a complex, a family of legal safeguards for diversity, of conviction, of identity, of argument. If not every political question is to be settled by power, by the contest about power, then argument and persuasion have to be built into democracy. And what I've sometimes called the ideal of an argumentative democracy is, I would say, the opposite of democracy as mass voting, mass opinion, majority tyranny. If we want to nurture and build democracy, we have to build and nurture a civil society in which argument and persuasion are taken for granted, in which it's possible for individuals, communities, and legislators to change their minds. Which is why, of course, no election in a moral democracy is the last election. There are forms of democracy which seem to assume that the ideal situation would be that final vote, that plebiscite, which once and for all established what was from then on always going to be the case. Germany in 1933 is a case in point, where in effect, the democratic institutions of a nation voted themselves out of existence, assuming that this was the last election because mass opinion had now established once and for all, not simply what was lawful, but what was right. Mass opinion had established what could not now be disagreed with. It was the result of a long process in which popular violence had been ignored or colluded with, in which the institutions of civil society, trade unions, churches, universities had been undermined, in which the voice of the people had been taken as a single abstract block of opinion which could establish once and for all what would prevail. I don't believe, in spite of some bad moments, that we are simply on the edge of a resurgent fascism in Europe or the United States. And I think it's a bit melodramatic to speak in those terms. But equally, I think it's important that we recognize that we do stand at a point of crisis in our understanding of democracy, where our failure to think through some of these issues, our failure to think through the significance of the rule of law and the rights of minorities, 
will bring us to a new kind of political crisis whose contours we can't yet see, but which could have in the long term as severe an effect on political health as did fascism. So what I'm calling argumentative democracy assumes first that it is proper to go on arguing, second, that persuasion is possible in public as in private, third, that major issues of public policy and public morality can be clarified by reasoning, by debate. In the last few decades, a number of issues which ought to be characterized by this kind of discernment have increasingly been either ignored or tacitly placed outside the realm of what can be discussed. Just to give an example, I'll take two instances, one more associated with the left and one with the right. There are still major moral issues debated around abortion. In our country, in most of Western Europe and in North America, abortion is legally available. Its legal avail availability has not in itself stopped public debate. And in our jurisdiction, at least in the United Kingdom, conscientious reservation on the part of some is recognized. No one may be compelled to perform an abortion. There's a recognition, in other words, that a minority has a right to be heard in debate and its conviction protected. But there is a trend towards the view that no one who holds certain views on abortion really ought to be active within the medical profession or indeed in public life. What do we make of that? Are we assuming that a majority judgment on the lawfulness of abortion, and I'm not discussing the details of the ethics of the question at the moment, are we assuming that a majority view has become unarguable and that disagreement with it is a barrier, in a sense, to participation in public life? There's a question, a methodological question, that I think needs to be talked about there, wherever you stand on the ethical question itself. Critical dissent on the subject of abortion tends in the United States, though to a lesser extent, I think, in Britain and the rest of Europe, to be associated with a broadly conservative approach to public life and public issues. But let me take another issue where principal dissent is more associated with the left, and that is nuclear armaments. We in Britain possess and are currently in process of expensively renewing a nuclear arsenal. The majority of the British population has voted consistently in favour of parties that believe in continuing and strengthening our nuclear military capacity. Those who have conscientious scruples about this will not, of course, agree that this makes the issue something beyond debate. We continue, though not nearly vigorously enough, in my opinion, we continue to have debates about the legitimacy of the nuclear deterrent. And it would again be eccentric if doubt or dissent in regard to the majority view of the ethical acceptability of the nuclear deterrent blocked people from access to political life or indeed office in political parties. I've deliberately taken two issues which are 
delicate to the point of neuralgia in themselves, but which have also featured in the United Kingdom in discussion in the last couple of years about the fitness of certain people to lead political parties or to make political statements in public. Make what you will of it as it happens. Um, to put my cards on the table, I am a dissenter on both counts <laughs> and therefore feel a certain interest in maintaining these arguments in the public sphere. But I hope the point is clear. Where issues like that are debated and scrutinised and voted on implicitly and explicitly in public, what we cannot suppose is that democracy means that the majority view is placed beyond challenge. Reference to the will of the people becomes profoundly dangerous when it, in effect, excludes from the people those who dissent, when it implicitly removes civic participation from the dissenter. And the next step may be, of course, the limitation of the real civic liberty of the dissenter. So, if majority voting does not determine something as beyond debate, we have to develop and mature an understanding of democracy which recognizes that argument and persuasion, not merely the power of a majority, settles a question. Now, all of that as an appeal to a particular model of democracy qualified by the recognition of minority rights, qualified by the rule of law, assuming ongoing debate, all of that, in fact, takes certain things for granted about what human beings are in fact like. It assumes that every human subject and in this context, every civic individual, every citizen, has a perspective on human and public issues that deserves attention, even if it's deplored or denied. You might say that this assumes even further that the very fact of diversity and argument in public is itself a good in that it reminds society at large of the sheer difficulty of settling certain questions once and for all and reminds society at large of the limits of its coercive power. That's to say, recognizing that each subject has a perspective that deserves attention is the ground of recognizing political liberty as something democracies must conserve and honor. Behind that, of course, lies a long tradition of moral reflection, not least in the Catholic tradition, where even the rights of a misinformed conscience can be recognized. You may, as a matter of fact, be wrong. Your conviction that you're right has, however, to be taken seriously. And since we're talking about the long history of a Catholic moral tradition, it's noteworthy that the discourse of human rights itself begins in a discussion of the limits of what can be demanded of the citizen. The limits of what human power can ask of a population. When Thomas Aquinas discusses these matters in the 13th century, he begins to lay the foundations of an understanding of power over against conscience in which certain kinds of self-determination are very explicitly removed from the kind of thing 
that a state can determine. And that is implicitly the recognition that power as such does not establish the good. And if it doesn't, what we're left with is argument. The argument of what we hope and trust will be an articulate and imaginative population, educated to the point where they can express conviction but also respond intelligently to the conviction of others. As soon as political power claims to declare in its own strength a final conclusion to any moral debate, it has become something other than political. The political, bound in with continuing argument, continuing discernment, and the management of irreducible diversity, the political has to remain at that level of limited certainty and limited control. Without that reservation, we are indeed left not only with majoritarian tyranny, but with a deeply disturbing underlying moral notion that power establishes good. And so here we come to a paradox about democracy and pluralism and diversity. If you want a diverse, plural, articulate, argumentative society, as opposed to a dull theocracy or any other kind of tyranny, you'll actually need quite a few people in it who have absolutist convictions. A good, modern, plural, secular democracy needs some bigots to make it work, <laughs> to put it rather, uh, perhaps rather over epigrammatically. That is, it needs to have a number of people around who don't believe that power settles questions, who believe that it's possible to argue about convictions, and who are willing to resist over-ambitious attempts by the state to establish itself as a reality that has the right to determine human choices without exception. So people believing in an absolute morality of some kind are a necessary irritant in secular plural democracy. They're vital to a good political ecology, but when they are themselves tempted to claim political authority for themselves, then they are caught in the same trap as a would-be majoritarian tyrant. That's to say, it may be the case that a society, broadly speaking, retains its majority view on a moral issue. It's just about true in the United Kingdom at the moment that the majority does not support physician-assisted dying. And for traditionally-minded Christians, that's something of a relief. But what the traditionally-minded Christian can't do is to say, this cannot and must not change whatever the majority position is. It's vulnerable to debate and discussion. Many people are persuaded to move to change their convictions on this. And what we've seen in the United Kingdom in the last 10 years is a steady move away from what was once a quite strong majority consensus to something much weaker. The religious community, the community of conviction in this context, cannot suddenly play a trump card Trump card is a phrase one ought not to use these days, I, I suspect. Can't suddenly play a trump card and say, well, we know we are absolutely right on this, therefore we cannot permit a popular vote and we shall resist it to the death. It's rather that this phase of the argument has been lost. 
And we now have to think what the next phase of the argument is and what kinds of security there are for the rights of conscience. So the political and the moral stroke religious community have to develop a careful mutual respect, a willingness not to be transformed into the other. The world of politics, of law, majority decision and popular vote must be very careful not to transform itself into a theocracy which seeks to end public debate. But the voices of informed conscience and moral discernment in communities of conviction must be equally cautious not to turn themselves into political managements seeking in their own way to silence debate. And the sheer difficulty of managing that is the difficulty of healthy democracy, I would argue. So in conclusion, what I'm, I suppose, moving towards is another paradox, that a healthy secular state, one that is, which is prepared to admit and to listen to a diversity of voices of conviction in its life, is one that needs some non-secular elements in it to keep the argument alive. A secular state that tries to homogenize the society it controls will risk that temptation of seeking to end public debate and discussion. And the contribution of theology, of religious conviction, and complex moral argument in a secular democracy, the contribution of all these things is to remind the state of its signal importance not as the source of moral wisdom, but as the source of legal security. Legal security for citizens whose voices are worth listening to. To believe that human voices are worth listening to is itself, of course, an act of faith. Most human beings, for most human history, have not assumed that most other human beings are worth listening to. And there are obvious reasons for that. But again, a paradox. Precisely those religious traditions, which are sometimes most awkward in public debate, are those which most firmly assert the worthwhileness of any and every human perspective. And without a universalism of respect and dignity, the entire argument for democracy of any kind falls to the ground. So what I've been trying to argue this evening is that we should be very careful about any assumption that there's an easy equation of democracy and majoritarian voting. That we should distinguish carefully between what democratic process makes lawful and any idea that it's the democratic process can make right or true. That we should assume that in a properly active, lively, argumentative democracy, strong and even absolutist convictions are not an embarrassment but a benefit for the social order in reminding the state of its limits and provoking continuing debate and the effort of persuasion. We need, I think, something like a theological anthropology, a doctrine of the human, to make sense of democracy at that level of complexity. Which is why Christianity has quite a strong investment in the independence of the secular state in some of the distinctions I've been trying to draw. It has the freedom and the obligation to enter into public discussion on the basis of its own conviction. 
It has the responsibility not to try and enforce its conviction and the responsibility to listen carefully and intelligently to the arguments that unfold in society. But if we're not to sink down into the dangerous swamp of a mass democracy where people can speak of enemies of the popular will, then we need some such reserve in which we allow that there is a dimension of the human itself not to be managed or manipulated by human power. And whether you are a religious believer or not, that belief in the untouched area, the area where power cannot and should not reach, is our safest defense against going back to the arguments at the beginning of the Republic and the proposals of Thrasymachus that justice is only the interest of the powerful. I believe that in our current climate, we need a far more developed and intense discussion in public of what we mean by democracy if we're to avoid that deeply problematic and menacing conclusion about power and truth. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming uh, tonight, Megan, and uh, to giving us this wonderfully rich uh, talk. Um, I thought I would ask just a few framing questions, because we have uh, uh, another line of questions to open up and then the audience. Uh, and I just thought that I might uh, open up, try to open up our conversation a little bit based on what you've said. Um, it's not uncommon to hear that um, religion and politics are polite conversation <laughs> topics. But I'm curious, based on what you said and the theological turn that you make um, in your talk, uh, in what sense is, how, I guess, how is democracy a theological idea? Or even the state? Hmm. How, how would you flesh that out? If we begin with... Um what seem to be the models of healed or restored human community that we find in scripture and theology. What we see is a picture of human togetherness or human community in which every subject is gifted in order to supply the needs of another. It's the imagery of the body of Christ. And I've sometimes argued that when we're talking about a political theology, we ought actually to begin with the notion of the body of Christ. That is the community in which anyone's suffering is everyone's problem and anyone's wealth is everyone's wealth. <laughs> and denying that and parceling up human good so that some have it and some don't, that we can't have that. Okay, so that's one of the possible foundations, as I said, for thinking of a world in which every perspective is worth taking seriously. But if every perspective is worth taking seriously, what are the mechanisms we use in order to limit or manage potential conflict and disagreement? The state emerges as that pragmatic resolution, holding, as we say, holding the ring, holding the, the balance of communities in argument not something which of itself exists over and above. Now, that's not exactly what St. Paul says in Romans chapter 13, of course, about the state and its authorities. But I think we have to distinguish what, for example, Paul in Romans wants to put forward as a realistic way of living in faith under an existing empire from what Paul also says about what human society optimally is, 
and how power and influence work within it. So I put my theology in, in those contexts. In that way. Well, you, you'd mentioned Lord Acton. I was just curious no, about yeah. his, his disciple. Uh, is it John Neville Figgis? John Neville Figgis, who, who yes, talks my, about, my hero. <laughs> well, I was just curious. Like, he talks about the state not as, as a community of argument, as you fleshed out, but a community, community of, of communities. communities. So is, is there a theolog- is there inheritance, and not a European skeptic argument, but just the, the opposite, actually, that the, the state is this community of communities of argument? Is that sort of mm-hmm. the line that you're running? I think so. And Figgis, who died about a century ago, was an Anglican historian and theologian, a preacher and a scholar of St. Augustine, who died very prematurely, but wrote a number of short and very pungent works on church and state. He follows Acton and Maitland and other 19th century English thinkers in arguing that we shouldn't make too much of an object of the state itself. The state exists because there are already communities of conviction and because those communities are already engaging with each other. Hmm. So for this ensemble of diverse communities and intermediate civil society bodies and so on, for these to hold together as a social unit, you need an agreed protocol about managing the stresses and the concerns. That's where the state comes in. So Figgis, in using that very resonant term, community of communities, allows us to see society not as a set of rules and associations prescribed from above with political and social identity flowing downwards, as it were, and everything franchised from the top, but as that which emerges to make a diversity of communities something like a coherent social unit in which the rights and liberties of every person can be guaranteed by a law that is settled among everyone. Okay. And, and if I was that, so if that's our picture of the uh, sort of a theologically informed picture of the democratic state, the, you were talking about the rise of populism as well, on the mm. other hand, or the rise of nationalism. Mm. Would you say that nationalism is inherently religious? Or would you say that it should be, it's better, nationalism is better considered as a secularized religion? Is, is, is it religious or is it a secularized religion that's or on offer that needs to be mm. sort of unmasked? A great deal of nationalism, I think, is secularized religion in that some, a lot of forms of nationalism say, what is the community to which I owe absolute loyalty, absolute life and death loyalty? And certainly from the early 19th century, the answer, the nation, mm. has been a very, a very powerful one, mm-hmm. especially when other kinds of identity, including religious identity, weaken. I think it's very interesting indeed that what we're seeing at the moment in the United States in the debates over the national anthem has emerged as a a way in which the United States is trying to think and feel through the question of what you're loyal to. Are you loyal to the flag and the anthem or are you loyal to the principles which that flag and anthem represent? Mm-hmm. And I think the sense of those who are dropping to their knees while singing the national anthem at the moment is the loyalty has to be to what those things represent in terms of a morality of community rather than the symbols with no questions asked. Yeah. So there is a strong religiosity in nationalism and even, as we know, even supposedly secular states can, can utilize that particular kind of emotional resonance to make sense of it. There's another dimension to this, of course, which I find quite difficult to unscramble. And that is, of course, the whole idea which goes back quite a long way that there are, if you like, providential aspects to the history or the governance or the culture of some nations. As if people are saying, well, there's some analogy to Israel in the life of 
Russia or Wales or Romania or very likely the Netherlands. You know, there's a national destiny, a national vocation, an identity that is somehow sanctioned and filled out by religious conviction. And I'm, I'm not too sure about this. I don't think I have quite such an activist view of providence as that. And while I'm quite willing to say that the cultural legacy of a nation may be a gift of God, that doesn't necessarily mean that it equates with a highly specific historical mission. So when I'm reading certain kinds of um, Russian discussions from the 19th century. I can see the slippage between two rather different things. On the one hand, says a theologian like Khomyakov in the mid-19th century, on the one hand, here are all these facets of traditional Slavonic society in Russia which seem to exemplify some of the great virtues of Christian community. The obshistva, the village community, is itself a kind of body of Christ. And you think, well, maybe. Um, but when you then move on to say, and so Russia has a historic civilizing mission to extend its political and military power so as to persuade everybody else of the virtues that it embodies, mm -hmm. a view which I think is still quite popular in the Kremlin, then my theological hairs begin to rise. And I think that's where we need to be a trifle cautious. Well, let's, let me try and draw this out a little bit. So what, how would you describe the proper relationship between the state, the church, and the individual? On, uh, if you can just pick up on your paradox. On the one hand, you would have uh, religious community, I guess uh, the question about how could religious communities better serve as intermediaries mm -hmm. um, between the state and individuals and yet still contribute to this democratic legal system. So you have the question of how could, how could democratic, or how could uh, religious communities serve, better serve as intermediaries? And on the other hand, you have the contemporary legal attitudes. How, how can contemporary legal attitudes uh, towards these faith communities actually use human rights legislation mm -hmm. or even citizenship, as you yes. mentioned, to undermine these principles yes. of yes. Uh, uh, liberal pluralism? Yes. So there's this, this tension here about the, the proper relationship between the state, the church, and, yes. and the individual. There is indeed. Um, and for, for two years recently, I, I chaired a working party of the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK, looking at precisely these issues. Mm. And the conclusion we came to overall was that a lot of the very interventionist legal approach which wanted to restrict the open expression of religious conviction rested on misunderstandings both of religious conviction and of the law as it actually stands. A lot of it was at the level of um, tribunals and informal conflict resolution processes which were often not well informed. And that, secondly, most of the issues of tension between people wanting to manifest their religion in public and, and their neighbours were matters which had to be resolved by culture rather than law. Mm -hmm. They were about civil, civic bridge building rather than enactment from the top. These were the sort of recommendations we passed back to government. Um, but we are in a a difficult moment, I think. It's important, let's just take the church for a second in the context you suggest. It's important, I think, that the church is seen as an unequivocal defender of universal human rights. Mm. That's to say that the church is crystal clear about its support for the rights of minorities, for including sexual minorities, racial minorities, and so forth. Recognizing that that support for universal human right and dignity doesn't in itself solve some of the difficult questions around those yeah. 
um, recognitions. One of the problems, I think, in the last couple of decades has been that religious communities have sometimes been seen as standing in the way of that universalism in order to preserve their own territory. Mm -hmm. I think if the churches were clearer on the need to affirm universal legal protection, universal human dignity, even at the cost of their own control mechanisms, mm -hmm. that would be no bad thing and might do something for the credibility of the church in plural societies. And to, you said that, that that would have to do not with power, but with argument. Yes. And this would be an argument that, that's animated with a sense of the absolute that's not representative, but what? But it's theological. There's a theological thing that sort of presents, that prevents us from sort of making ultimate or absolute our own particular point of view. How, how, do, yes. how, do, you, how do you work that out? A community of faith is a community which it's possible to leave. You can argue within it, you can disagree with it, mm. you can affiliate, you can disaffiliate. Mm. Um, it's the nature of freedom of faith. It's important to recognize that, I think. Um, therefore, the attempt to rule out dissent by law is a denial of something very fundamental about the nature of faith, the nature of humanity itself. So I see no problem with a religious community of perfectly absolutist conviction saying we don't have to shore this up with the support of the law hmm. because it's not that kind of conviction, it's mm -hmm. not that kind of power we seek. I don't think that's too paradoxical, but it does seem quite difficult to get it across sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it does sometimes mean that the proper exercise of influence by a dominant religious community in a state may be to use its leverage for the sake of a smaller community. Hmm. So if, let's say, in Bulgaria, to take an example of which I know very little, if in Bulgaria the Orthodox Church used its massive political and social influence in order to protect the liberties of Jehovah's Witnesses, I would say that it's doing its job. But I'm not holding my breath. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I'm just going to ask one more quick question. And um, how would you say studying theology and religion could provide the resources for this better analysis mm. and investment in local civic activism? Mm. in two ways at least. One is that to understand simply how communities of faith work, how their visions of the human impact on their decision-making and their public presence, that is something in which we all need literacy. We need to understand how these things work. Why do these issues matter? Why are human beings understood in that light? Mm. And with or without personal faith, to be alert and sensitive to those issues is more important than ever. It won't do simply to say that religious people believe what they do and do what they do because they think an overgrown fairy in the sky is telling them to. Mm. You, you read that language regularly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, let's grow up a bit in that discussion and invite people to understand how that, in fact, works. Secondly, as I hinted earlier, the world's religions, all of them work with certain models of community. They all have a picture, not only of what is good for the individual, but what's good for the community, for the person in relation. Christianity sees that in terms of the body of Christ, as I said. Um, Islam, in terms of the transnational and transcultural community, that is the Ummah. Judaism sees it in terms of the way in which the Jewish people are supposed theologically to hold up before the world an embodied model of God's justice. The Sangha 
in Buddhism tells you something about how the community of those seeking selflessness allows compassion to come into being between people. <laughs> now, all of those things are pertinent to how we think and how we feel about human community in routine society. They're not just remote ideals. They're all of them in different ways about options for human connection. And I think that's, that's one of the things which the study of theology and the practice of religions will feed in to a better and more mature grasp of, of the political process and the political ideal. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to have to turn it over to my other colleague here for the next questions, but I, I just appreciate you coming. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> Thank you. Good. Poem number two. <clears throat> Gethsemane. Who said that trees grow easily compared with us? What if the bright bare load that pushes down on them insisted that they spread and bowed and plated back on themselves and cracked and hunched? Light dropping like a palm, leveling the ground backwards and forwards. Across the valley are the other witnesses of two millennia, the broad stones packed by the hand of God, bristling with little messages to fill the cracks. As the light falls and flattened was grows on these hills, the fault lines dart and spread. There is room to say something, quick and tight. Into the tree's clefts, then, do we push our folded words, thick as thumbs? Somewhere Inside the ancient bark, a voice has been before us, pushed the densest word of all, Abba, and left it, to be collected by whoever happens to be passing, bent down the same way by the hot, unreadable bombs. Ellen, it's your turn. Professor Williams, thank you so much for your thought-provoking lecture. And I have a couple of questions, some just for clarification's sake, some more critical. The, just to start with, the title, you said, The Failure of Democracy. And if I understand you correctly, I have heard mainly democracy and the power of it but less of the failure. Could you tell me a little bit more about it? I think the title was The Failure of Mass Democracy, yeah. understood as um, that cast of mind which sees democracy simply as a popular will okay. or the rule of the majority. I think that the rise of populism, including nationalism, in recent years, <laughs> has shown us that that model cannot deliver security for a plural society, for the minorities that exist in society. And that's, that's why I want to talk about failure. And I think I'd go a little bit further than that and add that in a world of mass communication, then the temptation to reduce democratic choice to what some people call a beauty contest, that is to vote on the immediate attractiveness of personality and rhetoric. That's not exactly unfamiliar in recent electoral processes, and I regard that as another kind of failure. Post-truth politics again, mm -hmm. you know, that where it doesn't much matter what's said because what is said is said for that audience at that moment to produce that result, and never mind tomorrow morning. You hold the plea for uh, a democracy open to discussion, the right to dissent. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that give too much power to those who are able to argue 
to have the language, to yeah. have they have the education. And I don't know how it is in Britain, but in the Netherlands we see more and more a kind of two groups, mm. the more educated, mm. well educated, able to enter this kind of democracy, and the others who don't have. Yes. So isn't this too much of an ideal from the highly educated people? That's exactly the problem, I think, that we've seen in, in recent years. Exactly that divide between mm. people regarded as an articulate elite who control the public discussion and those who feel their voices are not heard. That's why I wanted to emphasize the principle of attention to every perspective. And if that's going to be a reality in an actively democratic society, then we have a lot of questions to ask about our basic educational tools and policies, and whether we are actually educating people for the exercise of democracy. Now, to say that can be interpreted as patronizing for those who are not educated. I think it's much more patronizing to say that we leave certain people's views unchallenged, undiscussed, so that the will of the people, once again, takes on a kind of solidity and becomes something beyond criticism. So I, I want to push that question towards a whole set of issues around popular education and education for citizenship, which in the UK is not, not brilliantly done, I think. Um, hmm. So there is a danger, and I think when you have something like the, the Brexit vote in Britain, you have a painful revelation of just how far the two discussions have gone from each other. Yeah. And you realize how much most of us live in an echo chamber, as they say. My son, who was a student at the time of the referendum, said, of course, that he had never met anybody who was in favor of Brexit. Well, of course he hadn't. He was a student in a humanities subject at an active provincial university. And you know, people don't last five minutes if they don't have properly liberal views there. <laughs> so, you know, th th there is a real challenge. But, but isn't it also the problem of too much rationality? Many people <sighs> don't vote rational purely. It's, it's also kind of sentiment of belonging. Yes, yes. And how do you cope with that? There was a very good book published in Britain, was it last year? I think it was. Yes, well, it was after the referendum, saying that one of the difficulties in debate about our referendum was that the pro-Remain party had good arguments but bad stories. Now, that doesn't mean you have good stories and bad arguments instead. It means that a good <laughs> argument is able to draw on some good stories. Mm -hmm. And that's where rationality needs some supplementing with imagination, to yeah. put it mildly. And where often in public political discussion we, we forget one or the other pole of that. We allow certain issues, it seems to be dictated by massive, highly organized sentimentality, and others to be dictated by tight, calculated rational and financial concerns, and we don't, it seems, want to tell a story in which the argument and the ideal are more, yeah. more deeply connected. So, again, there's, there's a problem. And I think in the debate about Britain and Europe, what we heard from those in favour of remaining in Europe was largely, don't vote against Europe because it'll be terrible if we do, rather than saying, well, actually, we've had 40 years of cultural, economic, social communion, which has been immensely enriching for us. And if, if this union didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. I think if we'd had some slightly better stories. But that's, sorry, I'm rambling, but... <laughs> That's partly a function, I think, of Britain being an island or group of islands, mm 
where the cost of continental violence and struggle has not always been felt as directly as it has, let's say, on the border between France and Germany. You mentioned now and earlier the important role of education. Um, we in the Netherlands at the moment have a, a problem, but that's not ju just purely Dutch. We have it everywhere. Where Saudi Arabia is financing schools of Salafists in which children are educated exactly in opposite to the views you defended. Are we, as a democracy, what do you think? How do we, how do we take this in, in our idea of democracy, open hmm. to disagree? But when you educate young people in one line, that's more than open for discussion. Yes. I think pretty well throughout the world there'd be the same story told about Saudi Arabian resources funding this agenda. And I'm as disturbed as anybody by that. And so are a lot of my Muslim friends. It's important, I think, to recognize, first of all, that education in any society is never going to be simply a private matter. If the state has a responsibility for holding a balance between communities, the state has an investment in helping those communities to relate to one another. And therefore, when there's a, a religiously based educational institution, I think the state has a reasonable claim not to dictate everything that happens there, but to ask some very hard questions about how that prepares people for the society they're in. <coughs> That's why I've rather unfashionably argued in Britain in defense of Muslim schools supported by the state on the basis that church schools are, because that brings those schools into the mainstream of educational <coughs> philosophy, the management of curriculum and so forth. They have to be answerable mm -hmm. for that. And I think that that's a proper responsibility on the part of the state. It's not the state trying to control every aspect of education but the state quite reasonably saying that for the state to do its job, it needs to be sure that these communities are not closed. Yeah. But we're up against a, a potent, highly organized agenda, which because of the somewhat insane politics of the West and the Middle East, is not likely to change anytime soon. And I think it's one of the elephants in several rooms. Saudi Arabia. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So yesterday... An elephant in the White House for a start. Uh, elephant. For, just to mention one. That's <laughs> yes. uh, Yesterday, the election in, in Germany. Uh, there you see for the first time right wings, alternative for Deutschland. Yeah. How do you cope with this kind of popularism? to really enter in dialogue with him, I, I agree. I think not to just to put him in an, in an angle and say, yeah. you are stupid because they are not. May I invite you to give your first reaction? Well, it, it, is, it is difficult because quite often you, you are up against um, a highly emotive set of convictions, not easily amenable to rational discussion. This is where, again, the question of good stories comes in. Yeah. And the only, the only good thing that happens when, <laughs> I'm showing my political colors, the only good thing that happens when a far right party gets a foothold in the national legislature is that they then have to argue in a different way. They can't simply repeat the slogans that have got them where they are. In order to sustain a position in that, legislature, they have to find another rhetoric and others have to find a rhetoric of dealing with them. And sometimes, as in Britain, that has the effect in the middle term of actually reducing their influence and their popular appeal. We saw a peak of electoral support for the United Kingdom Independence Party a couple of years ago, which has 
definitely disappeared for a number of reasons, not least Brexit itself, but also the perception that the members of that party lost credibility within the legislature itself. But then again, a new right-wing party is founded with the same kind of promises. <laughs> That's right. And this, this is, I think, an ongoing struggle in which we, we who don't share those views have continually to look for the narratives that will steer people away from xenophobic scapegoating conclusions. And it's, it's a long task. And we think at certain points in political history and in certain countries in Europe, we've got beyond it. And I'm fascinated by the development of Scandinavian politics in the last 10 years, where what many of us have regarded as the deep virtues of Scandinavian yeah. politics, a strong communitarian feeling, and all that goes with it, a strong welfare base, a powerful sense of mutual commitment, how all those things have made it extremely difficult for Scandinavian societies to cope with migrants from radically different cultures. And you have the rise of the far right in, in, in Denmark and Sweden, in places which, when I was younger, you know, we all thought were kind of beacons of unalloyed, yeah. lasting liberal sanity. <laughs> so, yes, it, it doesn't go away. No. Just one final question. You were positive on the church and Christianity's contributions to human rights. I agree in some sense, but not in all. <laughs> For example, the exclusion of half of humanity, mm -hmm. meaning women, then of the other rest of men, the homosexuality, the homosexuals, uh, then the colored people in the past. So you have only the defense of a very small group in the end. <laughs> so I always think we have to be very modest in this sense. As Christians sharing a kind of Christian history. It's not just human rights. It certainly isn't. But my reason for underlining it, I think, is that both Christians and secularists can forget the intellectual foundation laid in something like Aquinas' arguments about the limits of the state's power. The image I've sometimes used is that in many aspects of Christian theology, a long fuse is lit at some point. The, the fire is applied and the flame fizzles along very, 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 very slowly. And sometimes the trade train leads right outside the church and explodes somewhere else. I think that issues around the rights of women can be seen in part, partly in that light. And then the church has the real challenge of recognizing that as connected with its own deepest convictions rather than a threat from outside. And the church is notoriously not very good at that because the church is particularly prone to what we sometimes call the um, not invented here syndrome. If something good is happening somewhere else, it's not ours, so it can't be good. We, uh, we struggle with that, don't we? But equally, I don't want to be... <laughs> it's, may sound a bit odd, but I don't want to be over-modest about this because I do want to say there's something about human rights discourse which is not simply alien to the intellectual tradition we have. I agree. There, yep. there is a profound element of Christian scripture, of early and medieval teaching, which does affirm the limits of the right of the state, the dignity of the individual, and while we have misunderstood it and ignored it consistently, it's not another language from the one we speak. And I, I want us to be clear about that, at least. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.